Actually, I just uh, came to know some of our PhD students. They are in in one class, which is about ten minutes. So hopefully, they will join soon. Yeah. No worries. Okay. No worries. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Parish, uh, for uh, accepting our invitation to talk about uh, rabies and one health. And before we start, I will uh, <clears throat> would like to introduce uh, Dr. Tiwari. <clears throat> So, Lieutenant Colonel Harish Tiwari, uh, he is a uh, veterinary graduate from Assam Agricultural University. Uh, having completed his BVSE and AH in 1995, uh, Dr. Tiwari started his uh, baptism as a field veterinarian working for a, a dairy cooperative in rural Bihar. And then he won ICAR Junior Research Fellowship for his master's degree in veterinary public health and epidemiology from uh, Punjab Agricultural University in 1998, uh, where, where he uh, wrote a um, thesis on residues of caramycin and furazolidone in poultry meat. And that, 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 that's the first time I met uh, Dr. Tiwari while I was doing my uh, undergrad. I was, I think, in third year at that time. Uh, so uh, we are fortunate to uh, see you again, Dr. Tiwari, and then uh, he, he was commissioned in Remount and Veterinary Corps, Indian Army in 1998. Uh, during his stint with the Indian Army, he was involved in equine breeding training of army dogs, uh, providing veterinary care to military farm cattle and meat inspection duties. As a qualified dog trainer, he has commanded canine units of Indian Army uh, in active insurgency area. Uh, he sought premature retirement from the army as a lieutenant colonel to pursue his PhD in veterinary epidemiology. Uh, he was awarded international postgraduate research fellowship in 2015 and completed his PhD from uh, Murduch University of Western Australia. Uh, his thesis was on free roaming dog demography, community uh, perception and control of dog related rabies, uh, the Indian story. Uh, he joined Oswet, a global company working in the field of uh, animal disease surveillance and control, while still pursuing his PhD as a consul consultant and worked on Mycoplasma Bovis Eradication Project in New Zealand uh, <clears throat> as the operational epidemiologist beside some OIE and FAO projects. He is currently with the University of Sydney in the Asia Pacific Consortium of Veterinary Epidemiologists working on a project for epidemiological capacity building in Southeast Asia. He also runs an e-learning startup in India called TEPLU, uh, -E -E which was just the best startup in rural sect sector by IIT Bombay in uh, 2019. Uh, participants, if you get the chance, go and uh, visit their website. It's really impressive what Dr. Tiwari and others are doing. <clears throat> Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tiwari is passionate about applying his skills in epidemiology, disease surveillance, and data analysis, along with the organization and leadership capabilities to provide solutions for economic empowerment of rural populations in the developing countries. So he is committed to, uh, Arabi to a rabies-free India during his lifetime. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Uh, Tiwari. And he will talk today about uh, uh, rabies in India and one health. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tiwari. Thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rajneesh. I'm very thankful to you for giving this opportunity. Uh, before I start my talk, I must tell all the audience that um, I've spent uh, two very best years of my life in Ludhiana while I was doing my master's and I've got very um, sweet memories, great memories of then PAU, now Gadwasu. Uh, so I would like to this opportunity uh, to th thank everyone there uh, from the VC, Dr. Indrajit Singh, and Dr. Olak, Dr. Dhaliwal, and, and Dean, Dr. Guman, you know, with whom I've had great time um, during those years. Uh, well, I'm uh, here to talk about uh, the One Health approach to rabies control in India, the dog-mediated rabies in India. So my focus will be uh, more about uh, how the situation looks like in India and what it might take uh, to even to dream of and, and to attempt to uh, 
uh, eradicate rabies in India. I just hope that my slide is visible and clear. Is it? Yes. Sir. yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, uh, uh, let's start the talk. Um, so and and I'll just. Uh, uh, just also touch upon if we apply the One Health approach, what it will require, uh, and and which is a very important thing because without that approach, it will be difficult to achieve what we are trying to do. So, um, firstly, uh, let us talk about the fact file of rabies in India. So, as uh, some of these facts you must have already known, um, but some would come as a surprise to you. Maybe some you already know but maybe I want to make you realize once more. Uh, so the highest global mortality due to rabies occurs in our country. And surprisingly, not surprisingly, actually, more than 35% of these deaths that occur in India takes place for children who are less than 14 years of age. Out of every 100 tourists that visits India, 13 of them, a bit less than 13 of them, run the risk of being exposed to rabies due to the number of dogs, because 90% of the deaths in India are dog bite related. And with more than 25 million dogs, I mean, this is a very old figure. People now tell me that it's more than 60 million. So India is truly the canine capital of the world, world and we are we are, we are, the population is even more increasing. It has the lowest dog ownership ratio. Uh, that is out of thousand dogs, only four are owned by people. So we have that much of disparity between the owned dogs, number of owned dogs and number that are, uh, you might call it stray, I would call it free roaming or uh, the dogs who, which are partially owned. According to uh, statistics, a person is bitten every two seconds by a dog. So every two seconds, as we are talking, there are a number of people who are being bitten by a dog, and so they are being exposed to rabies. And 40% of the people who are getting bitten by these dogs, they don't even think that treatment is needed, they, that they need to wash the wounds or they, they need to get PEP. Coming from army, one thing that really moved me while I was there, I, I came to know, I saw a so, soldier lose his life due to rabies in front of me. And I did a big of digging up on, on, on rabies in Indian army. And this is a figure from 2014. There, there was at least, one, at least two, two people dying of rabies every year in an organization which has, um, all the medical facilities are relatively educated kind of people uh, go there to serve. Uh, so at least everyone is, is matriculate minimum, but still uh, we have about three soldiers uh, lost to this deadly disease. So let's talk about the burden of rabies. Uh, so we have, about 59 or really more than half of them happen in India. Uh, the, 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 uh, the economic burden is uh, 2.415 figures. And then uh, Dalis, the Dalis figures are uh, about 1.3 million for India, which is uh, very large. And um, actually it is more than some of the diseases on which more economy is poured like cystosomiasis, so it is even more than that. So why should we eliminate rabies? Why do we need to eliminate rabies? That is, the first thing is that it will prevent human deaths that happen due to dog bites. And secondly, it, it will prevent deaths in the population which is most vulnerable. When I say most vulnerable, it is not only the children who are less than 14 years of life, it also reflects those populations which are on the, mar on the margins of the society, marginal community. Either they can't afford or the, it, the availability is not there to PEP 
or they are not properly aware. Then thirdly, of course, it will reduce the disease economic burden. It will reduce the number of PEPs that are being um, given in the country on daily basis. I know that it is, it is given free of charge, but it is a drain on the national exchequer. So if we can come to a point where we are sure that there is no dog, dog, rape, uh, dog rabies or the dogs are the, the circulation cycle of the rabies virus in dogs has been interrupted, then that money could be saved. It will strengthen the animal health management. Now, this is a part which is very, very, very less studied in India. So it again has two aspects. The first aspect is that the burden of rabies on the livestock, like how many uh, animals are being lost to rabies due to dog bites in the rural areas has not been calculated. I've come across only one study which comes from JNK. Otherwise, there has been no, uh, no estimation of what is the economic burden due to livestock loss. That is one aspect that because if, if this disease is uh, removed, then at least that those uh, losses can be managed and animal management can improve. But most important is because it requires multi-sectoral involvement. So this would be a very good model for how one health collaboration can take place. Then finally, it will end neglect and inequality. So it, it will fulfill or give ticks to two of the SDGs, that is one and three, more of three, which is uh, good health and well-being. And also one, because we have to concentrate on the marginal communities who belong to the poor uh, um, poverty, who are below poverty level or at the poverty level. And so it will obliquely also affect um, to pull people out of the poverty. And we all know that rabies is fully preventable. So all this is achievable. So I think the first point to start with is to believe that we can eliminate rabies from India. So the big organizations, the OIE, GARC, World Health Organization, and FAO, they came together in 2018, and they developed a global strategic plan under the collaborative effort, which is called as UAR, United Against Rabies. And they aim to bring the deaths due to rabies by, uh, to, to zero by 2030. Um, before 2017, the goal was 2020, uh, but with, with very dismal effort from countries such as India, probably they again, pushed the goalpost by 10 more years. So you have now 10 more years to achieve that eradication. So zero by 2030. And in this strategic plan, they have three pronged approach by which they, they intend to use vaccines effectively, judiciously, the medicines, the tools and the technologies. Uh, they will uh, commit the resources in a sustained manner and they will generate, innovate and measure the impact of interventions. So this is a broad global level plan, but how do you approach for rabies eradication? So they have, ha they have developed a tool, basically OIE has developed a tool which is called SARE or stepwise approach towards rabies eradication. So you go, you take an area where there has been no intervention, there is no data available of, uh, of any vaccinations or, or uh, any interventions that has been taken. So for the first step is you assess the situation, you carry out the awareness, um, uh, um, how aware people are, what their practices are, and, and how much of vaccines will be required. And all that information that you assess, it will go into developing a strategic plan. And then you put in the interventions over a sustained period of time you do periodic evaluation of your of your uh, program, uh, and then you go back. You do course correction, and then you reach a stage where they eliminated, uh, and then you keep on. That is not the end of uh, the mission. You keep 
your efforts on and on so that you maintain freedom from rabies. So this is uh, broadly, I just wanted to brief you regarding um, the big plan of at the global stage and the tool developed by OIE. Let us now examine why India is failing to control rabies. So let us examine, I have, I've compiled some of the factors. Let's see how they fit in here. The first thing is that there is no incentive. There is no supposed in incentive if you control rabies. So, and that is why the, the disease is facing neglect. So uh, to cite you a latest example, so government of India is investing so much into eradication of FMD and brucellosis under NADCP, which was launched last year. You all must be aware, but such a program has never been launched for rabies. And that is because it is not a production disease. So it does not translate into direct economic benefits. And for this reason, never has been the burden of rabies on the nation has ever been calculated. And because these are not being done, the policy decisions are always away from any attempt or any plan to, to th even think about rabies as an alarming problem and, and to control it. So there is a gross, gross neglect because there is the, people feel that there is no incentive to control rabies, so let it be the way it is. Secondly, because there is no incentive, there is no government push, uh, so there is a failure, uh, there is a, a lack of awareness, not only in the communities uh, who are at the uh, receiving end of this disease uh, or even uh, the number of dog bites, but also in the health staff who are the frontline people who can, who can reduce the rabies incidence. Um, by carrying out simple procedures like dog bite or animal bite wound management. So you will find that many health staff are not uh, aware of this. Moreover, there is always a confusion between whose baby it is, whether it is medicine or it is veterinary. So you will find in rural areas or even in urban areas, when some, someone is bitten by a dog, so people will ask them the only cure they know or, or only suggestion they have is to tell them to observe the dog for 10 days. And, and that is a tricky situation. That is a very dangerous situation because uh, the person might even lose his life. And thirdly, children. So the, the awareness level is uh, in, in children is, is nil and there is no structured approach by the government, state or national to bring in that awareness uh, in the children. Uh, I think the latest uh, national education policy, which was launched a few months ago, that has now introduced an uh, element of introducing children to, uh, to animal welfare and, and how to deal with animals. So probably that is going to serve us uh, in, in future, but until now, there has been no attempt. Uh, while uh, Dr. Rajneesh had talked about my startup, which is called TEPLU, T-E-P-L-U. So we are now developing a short course, online course for children from uh, up to class 10th. And it will be a 15 minutes module, five modules about dogs and rabies. And we think that we'll be able to launch it by January, mid January, uh, 2021. So yeah, so, uh, I would love if more people are involved in such kind of activities or uh, even impress upon the government to include a chapter on rabies or a chapter on welfare of free roaming dogs in, in the primary school curriculum. So that those things would be a right step. But anyways, yes, lack of awareness is one of the reasons why we are failing to control rabies in country. And thirdly, <clears throat> There is a gross lack of studies. Glo about four percent of the global research on rabies is carried out on in, in India, but most of this research is concerning the laboratory innovations or the vaccine development. 
uh, that, that kind of thing. So there is no epidemiological studies that, uh, that are happening. And those epidemiological studies that are even taking place, they are only hospital-based um, uh, surveys, so which are always biased. So they are, uh, they are not community-based. So they don't go out village to village, door to door doing the survey. They just go to a hospital and they find out the data of how many dog bite cases, how many males, how many females. And that actually, it does not give us a right picture. Uh, so uh, I would recommend that there should be more um, community-based surveys, cross-sectional studies. Also, there are very few studies that veterinarians take, take uh, undertake on, on dog behavior or uh, free uh, roaming dog enumeration, or um, like the most famous intervention and which takes place in our part of the world is is, is ABC, which is animal birth control. So what is the impact of those in interventions? No such studies are taken to evaluate whether those in interventions are working good or then they, uh, they're lacking eff uh, efficacy or how those um, interventions should be done, what should be their frequency. So there are no studies on that. So another fact, another important step could be to initiate more studies into in, in the veterinary sciences that more master students take this kind of studies so that we can generate enough body of evidence to impress upon our governments, our policymakers to give more attention towards this disease. And finally, there is a gross lack of coordination. Everybody is doing something, uh, but they are not doing it in a coordinated way. So medical people are doing tremendous work. It is because of them that the number of human deaths have really come down in last um, five years or 10 years or so, because uh, compared to last uh, of what it was uh, before five years now, the availability of PEP or even immunoglobulins is, is more in, in rural areas. Uh, but somehow, uh, the, the disease may, may be controlled much in the, in the human beings, but still the virus exists. So there will always be outbreaks um, of, of uh, rabies if there is a little, um, if, if it happens in places or people are not aware and they don't go and seek PEP. Again, the government thirst it, it ha had been lacking. I hear that uh, now they have, uh, uh, now they have, uh, 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 made a, uh, they have just put the draft of national action plan on rabies eradication on Google. Uh, I would request you all to go there and read through the proposed plan. It has been it is being developed by NCDC New Delhi. So that is the right step. At least in 2020, they are doing that. But earlier that that the government did not put any thirst. NGOs. They are doing uh, great work, but their work is always very sporadic in time and um, and very, uh, sorry, infrequent in time and very sporadic in space. So they do here, there. So it's, it's not a concerted effect, uh, effort. And also the impact of their effort is lost because there is no continuity and there is no evaluation of their work. So that is about rabies. Now let us, let us talk about One Health. So what is One Health? So now One Health, it is a, it is a global activity uh, which says, which, which believes in the concept, which is, which is based on the concept that human health, animal health, and environment health, they are all interrelated and interdependent. And uh, it, it, is, it is important that these interdependent, the professionals of these three fields, they collaborate among themselves. With this mutual collaboration, they should fight transmission of diseases. They should check the uh, health of ecosystems. They can check the new novel pathogens, for example, COVID-19 although today it might be considered a disease of human beings, but it has, where did it start? It started with animals. So yes, they can check 
new pathogens from being um, born and and and, uh, and also the their collaboration can control zoonotic diseases and not only diseases and infections but also uh, the other things that uh, that affect the global health which is contaminants and toxins uh, which means that uh, for example uh, if there is a environmental pollution if there is water pollution or there is air pollution so it is going to affect all all the elements of the uh, global health like whether it is human health animal health or environmental health and what can be a better example than rabies where if you control the disease in dogs you are controlling the disease in human beings so actually rabies control is a classical example of one health approach and that is what the point i said before why we should uh, eradicate rabies so it will set up an example how animal management can be better done to control the problems in human beings so yes so it is an act, global activity which is based on the principle of interdependence of human health environmental and, and, and animal health where the collaborations uh, uh, of these multi sectoral um, organizations should be there to control or this to stop either morbidity of disease or mortality of disease or even any disease which is hampering which which may not be directly causing morbidity or mortality but hampering or stymieing the socio economic growth they they all can be solved through one health approach now there are some competencies of one health approach uh, which are required for a one health team to achieve its desired goals interestingly these competencies although as they are shown they are actually uh, required they are actually professed to be within the team however it equally uh, also stresses upon how these um, the principles or, or how these competencies are required for the team for the outside so let me explain like the first thing is management so because it is a multi sectorial approach there are many people from different sectors working together so you should have a good management team you should have a skilled manager to uh, manage your program who can who can manage all the gamut of activities like research how the interventions would be implemented how the data will be collected how data will be collected and analyzed how to measure the impact of the intervention and how we go back do a course correction and come back with a more potent plan so this is the outside management but within the management the manage, manager should be able to manage his team the veterinarians the ngos um the 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 volunteers uh, the the medical people and everybody has to be working together so that's why management is a very important skill which is required by a one health team second is participation so it is self explanatory because it is a multi sectorial um, approach so you have medical people you have veterinary people administrative people education ecologists so everybody comes together in the one health team uh, to collaborate and participate together then third communication again communication within the team there has to be a cohesion within the team of the, of the one health team there has to be communication within and there has to be a communication outside how do you communicate with with the with the communities where you are implementing the interventions so uh, and also to the industry that is going to develop or that is going to fund so it, it, there has to be a good channel of communication within and without the one of the most important competencies it should be actually first but i said last because uh, other other are equally important as well so yes for many people to be working together you need a very good leadership that is within the team so you need to have a project leadership who can guide the uh, team who can have a vision who can look beyond years and then 
think of how the other sectors can contribute to achieve that goal over a period of time who can influence the policy who can get more funds into how you are uh, how you going to uh, develop resources to to carry on with your project and finally he should be able to he or she should be able to convert into a sustainable business plan so these are the core competencies they also have values and ethics and culture and beliefs so values and ethics when you talk of within the teams so because it is a multi sectoral approach so you will have people working from different backgrounds coming together different upbringings but you have to have um, you have to have cohesiveness between you you have to have a, a value based approach where you are not indulging in in something which is causing harm to the project just to cite you one example i did my phd field work in panchkula which is not very far from you where i was counting the number of free roaming dogs and i have pictures i will not share it now but i can share with you privately where i have got uh, where i've got female uh, dogs with notched ears and which are lactating or i've got uh, female dogs with notched ears uh, that are pregnant so yes so that's where the values and ethics come from okay so it it is within the team when there you need a cohesion and then it is uh, and values where you respect each other you respect each other's uh, suggestions and try to get the best out of the team uh, uh -huh. to move forward but also without yes okay and and the other point is culture and beliefs again because it is a team so you have people coming from different cultures they have different beliefs that is within the it so we have to respect and then move forward um, with the cohesion but also outside the team um, and more important in a country like india so you we have northeastern states where people eat dogs okay so uh, there has to be a way where you can pass on the the information or the pass on uh, what you are trying to do in 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 a very very um very very nice way so that people don't hurt uh, get hurt uh, if you have been following the news there was a a, a blood bad blood between people who are trying to be champions of animal welfare and they're trying to say bad things to people in nagaland uh, so that that kind of friction should not be there even outside and that is where the cultural beliefs of people can come in that was a uh, uh, an example probably you will not relate to but i'll give you an example which is near to what 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 where you're living in the society where uh, you might be able to relate and that is like people like to feed their dogs so they would like to feed the dogs but they wouldn't take the responsibility to care for its vaccination or if it or, or veterinary care so if you go and tell them that please if you are feeding the dog please also give it a shelter then they will not listen to you but if you are taking the dog to a shelter home they will refuse that as well so now that is because in india Uh, there is a general tolerance um, for animals in their midst it's it's a very paradoxical situation where you love animals you respect animals but you don't want to do anything for them so we have to find a way by which we can break their beliefs we can bring in those behavioral changes and that is possible only when we have a good one health thing where we also have social scientists uh, who can bring in this change um i try to um mix up both uh, the competencies which are required within the team and how they can also give messages outside the team to in a one health approach i hope i was able to do justice if you have any questions please write to me now coming to rabies control how can we control rabies so it can be controlled in humans uh by dog bite management by giving pp and by spreading awareness uh 
human rabies part our medical brothers have done wonders i mean uh, as i told you before what is lacking is the veterinary approach uh, so we have actually not done much in eradication or in controlling the canine rabies or dog rabies dog mediated rabies and as i said the human rabies in india especially and most of the world like 99% of the rabies cases it comes from bite of a free roaming dog okay so how we can control rabies in dogs it's by mass vaccination by dog population management and by awareness so those are the grand principles so uh, let us see uh, how why a one health team is required so i'll cite you two examples and which is very practical like what is happening in india so in india if you talk about rabies control it means that you have to do you have to do abc so you, you, you there are number of organizations which are oh, what happened yeah there are number of organizations which are doing animal birth control so let us see if we have intervention called animal birth control and we we are doing that aloof from all other parts like uh, no help from education department no policy and no medico and we are just we think that if by, that if we do enough abc we are going to solve this problem so suppose in a <clears throat> in a community and uh, this is a hypothetical example so if we have 10 dogs so by rule of thumb we have five females and five males so we do abc and suppose we are very ambitious and we are doing 80% of neutering so by doing 80% of neutering we neuter eight dogs and we are left with two dogs and by rule of thumb one is a male and one is a female so what happens in next year so we have got two litters from those one male one female and we have 10 dogs at the end of next year so at the end of next year we have these 10 of the litter and 10 from the parent stock of which one two are two can reproduce and after a year even these are breedable they can also reproduce and mind you 80% neutering i mean it it is a mathematical thing so it it is uh, easy to understand so i took 80% but 80% of 25 million dogs imagine the resources it's going to take imagine the time it's going to take imagine how difficult practically it would be to catch 80% of 25 million free roaming dogs so let's see let's summarize what we have done so year 1 we had 10 dogs and we did abc and and we spend money for skilled veterinarians to do it we spend money on vet med stores we spend money on post operative care we also provided ppe if ca in case they get bitten because they are accessing the dogs the dog catchers so of course we will need manpower we did all that and then at the end of the do uh, end of the next year we have 20 dogs when we have attempted 80% neutering and in the next year year 2 we will be having six pairs of breedable dogs so they can they can again reproduce so that would require a extra abc effort even to maintain the population by which from which we started so according to a study uh, you can go through it say it's a old study 2013 which was done in i think uh, jaipur somewhere in rajasthan jaipur or jodhpur it says that 15 years of sustained effort of abc may be able to stabilize the dog population not reduce it but stabilize it so that is one example if we just think that abc is going to solve the problem okay a person like me i would say no we have to do enumeration studies and we have to do uh, we have to study the dog bite epidemiology so i put all the thirst on studies so we have uh, number of mvsc students 
the number of PhDs going into doing these studies, uh, but uh, they are not converted or translated into implementation of whatever the findings are there. They are not able to reflect in the policy decisions. So this is one more approach where it is an isolated effort to fight against rabies. So I just gave you two examples uh, to, to show you that there are two isolated efforts, which are both required. They are both saying that we are doing something for rabies eradication, but they are aloof of each other. There, there's no coordination. With that, let, let me just give you a review of, or, or let's both travel together a journey uh, where we see how um, the rabies situation looks like in India, because we all know how rabies is caused. We all know how rabies can be controlled. So let's start this. So we know that rabies is caused by rabies virus, which is a very fragile virus. It is transmitted by dogs. It affects people of low socioeconomic status because they are poor. They might be also very illiterate. Most of them are illiterate. Among them also, and otherwise also, it affects the children below 14 years of age. They are very vulnerable because they are short statured. And sometimes they, they, they are, because nobody has taught them, or sometimes they fall in situation with, with friends, they provoke the dogs. And once they get bitten, maybe they're not, uh, they're very, uh, sorry, not maybe, but most of the children, they, they do, they're not likely to report either to their teachers or to their parents because they're scared either or they'll be laughed at or, or maybe their teachers will become angry or maybe people will do nothing so they don't even report. And these bites, they come from free roaming dogs and free roaming dogs, why are there so many free roaming dogs? Because there is a societal acceptance and also irresponsible social behavior, which causes a, a, a great number of free roaming dogs on our streets. So what are these irresponsible social behavior? One is straying of pets. So people say that it is my dog. They will even name it like Tommy or Raja or Sheru, but they will not keep it restricted. So it is free to mingle with free roaming dogs. Sometimes if they are shifting houses, they will just leave it and the, dog, and the pet dog become, uh, becomes stray. Then abandoning of litter. So people keep dogs, but if there is a litter and they don't want to keep the pups, they just leave it somewhere on the road. So that is irresponsible social behavior. The second aspect we talked about was social acceptance. Why we have social acceptance of dogs in our midst, and that is that is that could be made maybe due to religious reasons. As I told you, there is a social tolerance to dogs in our midst. There are cultural reasons where there are societies uh, where they promote keeping dogs as community dogs. However, no particular person is responsible for their veterinary care. And also there are ethical issues. So uh, as I said, the situation is quite paradoxical. So we all love dogs. We all respect dogs. And dogs are sometimes even equated to gods. Um, they, are, they, they appear in Mahabharata stories and, and they, they are the guardians of the door of Yama. Um, so yeah, but we, we, don't, we don't know how to tackle them when they are on our roads. So there is a social acceptance and there is also a large carrying capacity. Now what is carrying capacity? Car carrying capacity is the capacity of the environment to sustain a species. And for dogs especially, it is shelter and food. So there is a huge carrying capacity which comes from sheltering. So the dogs can find shelters at many places. And during my study, I also realized um, it might look very unrelated, but we, uh, another issue, in, another social issue or maybe administrative issue in India is that as people are getting more and more dogs, uh, more and more cars as they are getting, uh, their, their lifestyle is, is bettering, but we don't have enough parking spaces. So people park their cars in front of their houses, side of the roads, and these cars, they serve as shelter to the dogs. So even in, even in a well-organized city, 
such as Panchkula, which would be just next to Chandigarh, I think, which is the most planned city in the country. Uh, even there, all the sectors and the se sector residents, the number of dogs were there because all these dogs, they took shelter under the uh, under these parked cars. Uh, so yes, so we have a lot of sheltering. Also, people allow the dogs to uh, come into their um, uh, the part of their house, which is outside, and dogs can stay there. Uh, then people feed the dogs, uh, and also there is um, the Indian streets are littered with with edible litter all over. So there is a gross garbage mismanagement. You can see dogs. Uh, assembling all around uh, the the garbage and 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 fighting and and getting food items out of there so yes there is a garbage mismanagement which also cause <clears throat> a large number of dogs so what are we supposed to do so we also know that wound washing is a good way to reduce the incidence of rabies so uh, also wound washing we can spread awareness among people that if they get bitten, they should clean it with soap and water for about 10 minutes. And then they should go for prophylaxis, um, PEP. And uh, then the other way we can control this is, is by doing con controlling dog population, which is also happening in our country. And then uh, because many people can't afford the PEP, uh, we have to increase their affor affordability. So government has made the PEP free of cost and availability. As I already said that the vaccines are already reaching rural places. So most of the PHCs and a part of my rural study was in Maharashtra. And I found that most of the PHCs, even in the remotest places, they had PEP with them. So availability is increasing. It's, it's really commendable. Then uh, we can do culling of the way we live in India, the way the, the uh, ethics we believe in. So culling is out of question. And then we have remained with animal birth control. And then in animal birth control, we should see how many we have to um, and neuter. And so we have to do something about dog population dynamics. We can, uh, once we know that number of dogs or otherwise we can carry out mass vaccination of uh, dogs. We can also manage our garbage properly so that the carrying capacity of the environment is reduced. And so we can control the dog population. Then we should increase the rabies diagnostic facilities. Uh, and then we should promote responsible ownership of dogs so that people can restrict the dogs uh, within their premises, not make, uh, allowing them to mix with uh, the free roaming dogs and also take care of their veterinary cover, get them regularly vaccinated. So this is how, uh, and then this is something very bad. So another thing which has not yet been taken up in India, but I think one important point is that we have to impart economic value to the dogs. So I believe uh, I have been a, a dog trainer and I've had the opportunity of training these free roaming dogs. And I found that they are equally good or equally bad as the pedigree dogs. So they can be trained. So we have to find avenues where these the qualities of these dogs can be utilized. And by that, we will be adding economic value to the dogs. And when their economic value increases, then their adoptability can increase. So, um, so this is how in, this is how the picture looks in India. How we are fighting rabies. So, does this look very pretty to you? I mean, you don't know what is happening, who is doing, but everybody is doing something. So that is how the rabies fight in India looks like. It is so cluttered. So, what do we need to do? So we are already doing all the things. We have to apply all the interventions that we know of, all the knowledge that we have. We have to apply all of them at one place at, at one time. And we have to keep that effort sustained. So we have to uh, increase awareness 
of the virus and its vulnerability, the importance of washing. We have to do campaigns across the socio-economic mosaics, not only in the communities which are marginalized, but also the middle class people, even the higher communities involved, schools, colleges, uh, clubs, then we should utilize the print electronic media, the, the multimedia, the social media, then we should impart the knowledge to the school children. Availability, yes, we should make the post exposure vaccines uh, available, uh, the dog vaccines, even the radio, uh, RIG. And then <clears throat> we have to carry out studies in dog population dynamics. And finally, we have to improve our diagnostic facilities. So it would be much better if what we are doing is done in a, in a concerted way, in, in a clear way with a One Health approach. So for all these four measures to, to take place at the same time, we would need most of the people who are not, who are from diverse fields. So they have to be medical people, they have to be education people, administrators, they have to be people who, who from finance. So that team, when gets together, then we can achieve this. So, so who is the enemy? So I have talked so much, I would come across as saying that probably dog is the enemy. But mind you, my friends, it's not the dog, it is the virus who we are fighting with. So dog gets the virus, but dog itself is, is a sufferer, it is a victim. So the dog itself dies in a, in a very pathetic way. So we are also doing harm to dog welfare if we are letting him remain on the streets. So in a One Health approach, uh, now this is a real One Health approach where you need people from, from social circles, from medical people, the economic people, the political people, educational veterinary, ecological and cultural, they all have to come together to fight the virus, okay? And, and that is what One Health is, uh, approach is all about. Uh, so I think I've come to the end of the One Health approach. So as of today, it might still look a very Herculean uh, task to, uh, to eliminate rabies from, from India. Uh, but this is a picture I took uh, beyond Uri near Pakistan border. And it, the, our soldiers were there high up in the mountain and, and it was a steep climb of, of um, like you had to climb about uh, 12 minutes on a steep climb to reach the post. And on the top of the post, I found this and it was, it is written by Brigadier Jag Verma. I don't know him. But I took this picture there in, way back in 2012, and I always keep this. Um, there is a spelling mistake, but never mind. So a mountain is not higher than your confidence because it will be under your feet once you reach the top. So it might look like that, no, this condition is not going to improve. I mean, rabies is a done thing. I mean, it is something like what our politicians told about COVID a few days ago that, it is there with us to, and we have to live with it. But no, we have a choice. We can defeat rabies. And once we get our acts together, if we are able to demonstrate that we are applying all the interventions at one time, at one place, and then probably we can emulate that example all over the country. And once we start doing that, then the mountain will be uh, under our feet. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my email address. You are free to contact me. I've got a number in Australia. Join me on WhatsApp. This is my India number. Uh, this is always, um, it's not on WhatsApp, but yes, I can get a call on this one. Um, so if you want to send a message or something, I have a company called Tapelu. Uh, it, kindly visit, uh, thank you Rajneesh for introducing it. I was not planning to introduce on this forum, but yes, it is a very good uh, effort from my friends.
I have a little contribution there. And we have already launched uh, a course on daring. And um, I've, I've, we have got some uh, 30 subscribers from Punjab. Uh, we've got about uh, 1,500 subscribers all over India. It's just been launched. In, in in august so yeah we are doing okay so please visit that we have employed a young veterinarian there to do some content writing for us we are hoping to launch uh, my, our next project is rabies so yeah we are hoping to launch the first online for the school children um, in in january uh, and after that we'll take it from there so please visit the website it's www.teplu.in t e p l u uh, why it is called TEPLU is that we design courses which could be understood by anyone who is 10 or more, 10 plus. So we removed the N and S and from 10 plus it became TEPLU. So it's very simple. Uh, the dairy course is currently launched in Hindi, English and Marathi. We are working on Punjabi. We plan to you know, launch on in all Indian languages. Uh, for rabies, we'll start with uh, English. And then because it's for school children and we believe that most of them understand. And then the first switch will be in Hindi. Uh, so please visit that. I'm on Twitter by Epi Harish and this is my Facebook page. Please, uh, if you have any questions, um, I'm ready to answer them. If you would like to send me an email, most welcome. And uh, because uh, I'm with the veterinarians, I'm talking to the veterinarian from, uh, from my own alma mater, uh, being a senior alumni of yours, I I want you to spread this message among whomever you get in your community, friend circle, your parents, your uncles, your neighbors, uh, that uh, we have to fight rabies and we have to defeat it, um, and we have to defeat it before uh, Colonel Tiwari dies. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm open to the questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Tiwari. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. So we uh, we do have a question from Divya. Uh, okay, so the question is, what kind of uh, epidemiological studies can be conducted regarding rabies as there is no antibody response or what kind of seroprevalence studies can be conducted? <clears throat> okay, seroprevalence studies. <clears throat> Uh, you can carry out uh, zero prevalence studies, but it depends upon how much uh, funding you would have. The zero, uh, the serum testing kits are quite costly. Uh, although the, a couple of studies have been done um, with the mission uh, Rabies India, uh, so at this point of time, as we are just uh, starting off, um, I think the best way would be uh, to to do some cap studies. Uh, uh, to find the awareness level of people, to do some studies on behavioral change. So you can start and, um, and, and convey the message to a part of the community and then come back and see if their awareness level have increased. Uh, you can have the indicators like uh, the number of bite cases that are being reported in the local rabies center. So if the awareness level increases, our people are doing more uh, wound washing at their home, how many people are getting into uh, PEP. Also, um, if I mean, that might be a little different from what you're doing, but it can be attempted. So if we can uh, start working on free roaming dog behavior and to come up with the things that can increase their adoptability and that and we can demonstrate uh, by indicating the number of dogs uh, being adopted over a period of time has increased. Um, that could be a good uh, study as well. Thank you. So I have a question, uh, Dr. Tiwari. So if I yes. am getting your uh, point, so the most, I think uh, the, the target uh, population which should be uh, studied if we talk about the awareness among people, so I think this is mostly the children below 14 age, 14 years of age and the dog owners. So what's your take on this? So these are the two uh, target populations we should target for doing such cap studies or? Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, I, I, I did not intend to say that. Look, everybody, uh, 
okay there, there is population which is vulnerable uh, uh, because of reasons uh, uh, their uh, affordability of of pep so those are the reasons why they become uh, uh, vulnerable the school children they uh, the children below 14 years of age they become vulnerable uh, because they are more likely uh, to provoke the dogs while walking to the school or being exposed to a to a to a pugnacious dog and they don't know how to handle the situation and also if they get bitten um, they are not likely to report uh, so yes uh, they are a target population uh, but everyone is i would say has uh, the equal probability of getting bitten by a dog so i would say your target population should be uh, a open cross sectional study so you can take a village it should be community based so it should not be when i said it it should not be hospital based it should be so you go door to door so okay let me elaborate by an example so in a uh, hospital based study you will come out with statistics like so these many people reported dog bites in this period of time these many were males and these many were females obviously males are more and they would say uh, in many papers you will find that the males are more likely to be bitten why because they venture out more and and they go out in search of jobs you can find these reasons in many. i did a cross sectional study i went to a village in baramati and i i i went door to door not looking for people who were bitten but just going door to door to just to know how what their rabies uh, awareness level was and to my chagrin and i'm sorry that i did not include that part in my uh, pre tested questionnaire and pre ethics approval questionnaire but to my chagrin i discovered that I, I interviewed about uh, 100, uh, 219 family, 205 families, five how households, 205 households in one village, and there was not a single village who did not have a near or a little far relative who had died of rabies. Mm-hmm. You know, not the bitten, but died of rabies. And of course, not all of them got reported. so yes there could be a study where you can go to a village and do a maybe uh, and maybe a focal group discussion where people will come out with this facts and when they are sitting and when you project this as a group thing that so many people have had the incident then the awareness will increase then the sensitization will increase and that's how the things will improve so what i am saying is not to do a hospital based study but do a cross sectional study it could be anywhere of course if it is towards the marginal society so if you have got a slum area of course that would be more challenging to carry it out there rather than in uh, i'm trying to remember rather than in sharabanagar yeah so uh, uh, sharabanagar is quite posh you know but incidentally i in 1997 there are still free roaming dogs in shrabanagar area but if i am trying to look for an area or target area for do do my epidemiology study i'll look for a marginal society residents like slums or maybe uh, where population is more and there are also a number of dogs are more yeah another study i would uh, uh, recommend is doing some studies on dog behavior um so how they behave in in groups how they are behaving in uh, when they are alone so in my study i found that in city areas in urban areas in panchkula the they are more likely to be found alone you know that 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 is some, that actually surprised me and that is because it was the dogs in the villages even though they are also free roaming their association with human beings was more intimate so they were they are used to a uh, human uh, proximity so probably in 
in that village it would have been a great idea to do door to door dog mask vaccination campaigns but in in panchkula which is like highly urbanized uh, the uh, dogs tend to be in groups and now when they are in groups their uh, the the fighting characteristic is is uh, or the uh, attacking characteristic comes out you know so when they are, you are trying to approach them for vaccination so they they will try to attack you when they are in groups you know so and that is because there is garbage management mismanagement most of the dogs are no are, are truly feral even in uh, urbanized city like panchkula so if you can do some uh, studies on dog behavior and then recommend some ways of mass vaccination so uh, probably if they are more in groups found around garbage places probably it is time that we have a serious look on oral vaccination for uh, oral mass vaccination for dogs um, so who has approved it uh, albeit it has to be done under supervision but that is one area where we can uh, see the efficacy of uh, um, uh, the oral vaccine and going back to uh, divya so once that happens then probably it will be a good idea to do a zero prevalence you know uh, of of the teeters of of after the vaccination how much of protective immunity they have thank you very much uh, yeah, thank you so, thank you very much such a wonderful talk and i i hope all the students and participants must have enjoyed your talk so at the end if there are no more questions sir once again uh, sir i am having a question okay Yes, yes sir sir i want to know sir after the after doing these kind of studies like if we find few dogs which are having behavioral changes and they are attacking people or other dogs what to do with that kind of dogs because uh, they are uh, difficult to manage and they are difficult to do the treatment also what to do with that kind of uh, dogs uh, uh, are we supposed to uh, uh, like call them or what should we do uh, uh, with that kind of dogs because they will spread the rabies to the other dogs also yeah that is that is a very good question divyansh and it is very pertinent as well um i'm actually at pains to tell you that the the law and regulations in india uh, they don't allow you to call a dog even if it is uh, carrying confirmed rabies virus so you have to leave it in segregation until unless it dies it's uh, it's natural death so yes i don't know how to <laughs> tell this to you but yes so the only option is you put it in segregation uh, but yes you cannot you cannot euthanize it um, so you keep it in segregation so that it is not in contact with other dogs and that is why we need more epidemiological studies to come out with such body of evidence to pressure upon the policy makers who make all these ridiculous laws you know so uh, uh, in india there is a law that you can feed any number of dogs on the roads but we this is a treachery we i mean we domesticated dogs 5000 year 10000 years ago to be with us to be our friends and uh, to be our companions not to leave them on roads yeah so if we are leaving them on roads we are turning our back to them so we have if streets are no place for dogs and we have to come up with such studies come up with such recommendations so the people behavior and that is what it comes you have to uh, bring a behavioral change a thinking change in such a magnitude that people are compelled to change this uh, uh, ridiculous laws and and regulations you know and and more and more people understand the importance of keeping if i have a dog i better keep it with me i i keep it on leash i take it for walk then it is it, 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 it i am giving proper care to its welfare but i am just trying to be showing that i am uh, Uh, I, i care about the welfare of dogs i feed them on the roads and then i go back what if there is a vehicle 
something it hits the dog so i am not doing any 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 good thing to the dog i'm actually putting its welfare at jeopardy so basically um, we are deceiving them so long decades centuries ago we we made them our companions and now we are playing tricks with them we are just putting them on the street especially in india where we have they say that the word rabies comes from sanskrit from the word rabhas i don't know why they say it so proudly that even if we if and and they say it's mentioned in vedas so it was mentioned in vedas 5000 6000 years ago and today we boast of highest rabies deaths so where have we come we have to have our our fundas correct you know what is required what is the true meaning of welfare i would also encourage some of you to take up uh, welfare studies uh, how to to ascertain what is welfare and what is not how uh, feeding of dogs is is harming um, the dog the humans as uh, but it is more harming the dogs so if you can carry out epidemiological studies on on the parasitic load of these free roaming dogs okay on on and the amr because of these dogs okay uh, uh, collect their feces collect their uh, things and get maybe genome sequencing or run basic uh, antibacterial residue tests and see uh, if there are bacteria which are not resistant so there are many links you can go i'm just throwing some points but Uh, the crux of the matter is that we have to generate enough body of evidence so that the people who are sitting there are forced to think that they have to stay, take some drastic actions sorry i am getting emotional divyansh but i hope you i answered your question yes sir. yes sir. thank you so much yes yeah. is there any any other question uh, good afternoon sir please yes. always always uh, identify yourself please tell your name and then ask question okay Uh, my name is Simran Deep Singh. Yes, Simran. Sir, my question is that uh, usually uh, 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 from th- uh, a time ago, ABC the animal breeding control programs are followed in India. Now I'm seeing a trend that uh, they are saying that uh, uh, that in, uh, instead of ABC, we are going for the spaying all the female dogs, leaving the male dogs uh, uh, untouched. i see that uh, eventually this will call uh, extinction of the indian breeds do you feel that this uh, strategy is right that uh, one side india is trying to make uh, indian breeds popular so that people make domesticate uh, domesticate them and other side they are just uh, vanishing of them is this strategy good or what's your opinion on this okay mm. thank you for asking this um Firstly, uh, let me just uh, tell you about ABC, the Animal Birth Control Program. So I am not saying that it is of uh, no use. Uh, in a country like India, with such a huge population, it has to go on alongside mass vaccination. But m- mass vaccination of free-roaming dogs should be at the uh, vanguard. That should be the lead intervention, and also assisted by. Um, Uh, abc but abc should be more structured planned and and subject to evaluations uh, and uh, so yeah in in a more planned way secondly regarding um is paying and and neutering um male or female uh, both so of course uh, spaying is uh, is going to cause uh, will be will be more affecting uh, effective in um, in reducing the population because it is the female which which gives birth so if you spay uh, one female so you are um, contributing more to uh, restrict the birth of new pups uh, then you have to spay so many male dogs however in many places uh, both are done um, regarding indian breeds so one has to be clear what indian breeds are so when we talk of indian breeds the official breeds are only few one is like rajapaliam and i think uh, one is uh, mudol hound and all that the the free roaming dogs that you find 
on roads on the streets i don't think anybody is adopting them for their breed preservation i don't think so they there are only two people two kind of people who adopt these dogs uh, so they, they are really dog lovers and yes they feel about these uh, free roaming dogs and they bring them home and the other people who say that they are adopting they only loosely adopt them like they are not they they will sometimes feed them even if they it doesn't return to their home that night they are not bothered so that is only partial adoption and with the number of dogs we have um we we have to travel a very long way on the roads of abc to come to a stage where we start worrying about extinction of this um indian free roaming dogs so the the local dogs or the mongrel that we call call um, call it as so they are not really breeds so that is another area i would request you the people who are going into animal behavior to to check their trainability to find their usages so that their adoption increases uh, but coming back to your question i don't think that we are mm, in any danger of facing extinction of those uh, dogs in any new, near future so yes uh, but at the same time that doesn't mean that abc is the uh, solution for uh, rabies control and elimination no it is not it can support the mass vaccination and awareness and um uh, increase in adoptability uh, but uh, it, it should not be at the vanguard of the whole mission did i answer your question simran yes sir sir my cause of uh, concern was because that uh, today for the indian cattle breeds the indigenous breeds we are we are just facing very 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 hard and difficult times for uh, preserving and get best jump plasm of that because uh, uh, we had a practice to use cross breeding and now there is a trend of indigenous cattles and here then there the things are changing and one more thing i want to make a a, a good news to you that uh, i made five uh, five pups uh, was born last month uh, near my place and i made them adopted for adopted for five good very caring horses and five oh, that, is, that is really commendable that is really commendable keep up the good work uh, yes i can understand uh, from where you are coming from but mind you uh unless the uh, i mean until this situation happened about 5 6 years ago uh these indigenous cattle that have now become are, are on the verge of extinction and we are importing back our uh, indigenous blood back from brazil i know that but these cows were not so called strays okay they were all reared by farmers so they were not free on road they were not breeding like dogs you know they were not breeding indiscriminately these uh, free roaming dogs uh, one of the reasons why their population increases geometrically is because there is no control over their breeding and that's how the abc comes into picture but those cattle they were already owned by someone and they were th their breeding was restricted okay it was not that they were just breeding somewhere and so that is the difference mm, uh, and and it was a planned way which involved government to replace those breeds once upon a time so ai in india started way back in 1950 where the first semen was got from australia i think and it was a planned way how these breeds uh, were upgraded and finally we lost them um that was a policy thing that was a, a a government decision no such thing is happening in the uh, strayed uh, i mean the free roaming dog area um so yes uh, i mean you have a point but i don't think that danger is anywhere near uh, the primary concern today is that we have to remove the virus from the dogs so that there are no more deaths and and we can break the cycle of virus replication and uh, the rabies virus replication that is our primary concern and um, n what you are saying may have some um, importance maybe 
maybe when we reach zero by 30 near 2028 or so. Yeah, but at this point, I think this is more important. Thank you so much. Excuse okay. me, sir. Uh, sir, my name is Srishti. Hello. Okay. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you explained about the mass vaccination. Yeah. Uh, sir, as the vaccine provides immunity only for one year, so how are we supposed to implement in the stray dogs? Like we will not be able to find the same dog after the one year. No? So all the vaccination will go waste because it will only provide immunity for one year. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Srishti. Thank you very much for asking this. Uh, there was an aspect that I did not touch. So I, uh, I would recommend uh, doing some dog enumeration studies by which you will be introduced to uh, capture, capture studies and the new technologies by which you do it by photographic recapture. And then uh, there are ways by which there are uh, now being introduced and apps being developed where um, the photo recognition of the facial recognition of dogs are into um, are, are being done. So probably that is another area the budding epidemiologist can take uh, dog enumeration and developing uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence into an app where dogs could be recognized. So that is one way where you would come to know whether it has been vaccinated earlier or, uh, or not. And uh, the second part, like if you vaccinate now, so dogs usually, they, they remain in that area. So if you are doing the vaccination every six months, so it's not that you do a mass vaccination now and then you come back after a year, because obviously the first time you do a dog vaccination, you will have many dogs which which were not covered so you have to repeat it maybe after three months where some of them uh, that were not caught in the first instance will be caught now and then you vaccinate and so i have actually developed a three four point program so how you should do it like you go to an area enumerate the number of dogs attempt a mass vaccination then see how many have been vaccinated according to the enumerated number you found. Suppose you found that there are 100 dogs and you go in the first attempt, you are able to vaccinate only 55 dogs. Then you come back after three months and you again vaccinate. And this time probably you vaccinated only 40 dogs, but out of 40 dogs, say 25 dogs are new dogs. So now you have 55 plus 25. So you achieved 80%. So you won't achieve 70% in the first attempt, but maybe after three months if you come again, you would achieve that. So when you come in the third year, again, you, uh, so, sorry, uh, the third time you again do it, some more dogs will be covered. So the principle says that if we are able to vaccinate 70% of the dogs, then the virus will be, uh, the transmission cycle of the virus could be broken. So if we can achieve that, so this mass vaccination attempt has to be repetitive. And if you can have that app, we can develop that app through machine learning, which will require a lot of data. For example, I when I did the enumeration studies, I've got about uh, 9,000 photographs of dogs. So I'm trying to get that uh, data to develop a, a, a app which can which can recognize the dog so you know that it's been vaccinated earlier, so it can be left. Then secondly, you have to take into consideration the population dynamics. So, so many dogs would die, so many new would be born. So what is uh, the population intake and how many uh, dogs are being added? How many, the population, whether it is going down or going up. So all that will uh, affect uh, the mass vaccination program. So all these uh, things require a lot of study. Uh, what I'm saying is uh, I, I have um, proof for only 50% of the things that I'm saying because of the kind of papers I've read or the work I did. But I would encourage more and more uh, of you to take up these studies um, in, in dog enumeration, dog behavior, so that we can get a uh, 
a real procedure for how to attempt uh, uh, effective mass vaccination program. Did I answer your question, Shristi? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Also, uh, you, you uh, no worries. Also, you you people should get in touch with the the public health uh, institutions in uh, India uh, to to do some research in coordination with them. So, uh, if we are uh, multi institutionalized uh, groups uh, doing a kind of a research, then uh, besides uh, you sorting out your funding issues, uh, also we generate a common uh, body of work and and uh, and and also the there is spread of knowledge across um, different states and uh, different institutions. So you should uh, you should be in communication with places like NCDC, IPHI, um, the national uh, even uh, in Bangalore. What is it? Uh, Nivedi. Um, there is a very good uh, NGO. Um, which is doing great work in uh, rabies control. And he was my adjunct uh, supervisor, Dr. Abhi Vanak from ATRI, Ashoka Trust for Research on uh, eco uh, Environment and the Ecology. Uh, so uh, contact him. He carries out, uh, he guides people uh, on their M masters and also does uh, some internship is available with the, with him sometimes, so you will get an insight on how to uh, tackle this problem from a from a, he's an ecologist, but he's a, a learned person and he knows a lot about it. Um, so yes, so you try to network and get to different places um, if you are passionate about it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Doctor. Dr. Tiwari for answering all the all the questions. It was a wonderful, wonderful QA session we had. So once again, at the end, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Tiwari on behalf of uh, organizing committee, on behalf of uh, principal investigator, Dr. Ghuman, who is also Dean College of Veterinary Sciences, as well as Dr. Olak, uh, Director, um, School of Public Health and Zoonosis, uh, as well as uh, on behalf of our institute. We would like to thank you for accepting our invitation and sparing your time to talk on such an uh, interesting topic and i hope uh, uh, all the participants must have enjoyed your talk and uh, <clears throat> once again thank you very much and uh, at the end i would also like to thank uh, dr uh, indraji singh vice chancellor who always uh, of goodwas who always supported us or encouraged us for such uh, uh, activities and <clears throat> once again Thank you very much all the participants who have actively participated and I highly encourage you to attend other seminars uh, which are happening next week to more. Uh, we have speakers from Canada, University of Saskatchewan. One is talking on uh, antimicrobial resistance and the other one on foodborne parasites. Uh, and I will, <coughs> thanks again. And at the end, uh, uh, Tajeshwar and Poonam, thank you very much to both of you also for uh, doing a lot for uh, these seminars. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Tiwari. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for this opportunity. I am uh, really very pleased to give this talk and for Gadwasu students, my alma mater. So uh, good luck to you all. And as they say in Punjab, uh, fatte, whatever you do. And uh, Jahin, thank you very much. Jahin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.